Book Four, Chapters Five and Six of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Four, Chapters Five and Six. Chapter Five. How Moses conquered Sihon and Og, kings of the Amorites, and destroyed their whole army, and then divided their land by lot to two tribes and a half of the Hebrews. The people mourned for Aaron thirty days, and when this mourning was over, Moses removed the army from that place, and came to the river Arnon, which, issuing out of the mountains of Arabia, and running through all that wilderness, falls into the lake Asphaltitis, and becomes the limit between the land of the Moabites and the land of the Amorites. This land is fruitful and sufficient to maintain a great number of men with the good things it produces. Moses therefore sent messengers to Sihon, the king of this country, desiring that he would grant his army a passage, upon what security he should please to require. He promised that he should be no way injured, neither as to that country which Sihon governed, nor as to its inhabitants, and that he would buy his provisions at such a price as should be to their advantage, even though he should desire to sell them their very water. But Sihon refused his offer, and put his army into battle array, and was preparing everything in order to hinder their passing over Arnon. When Moses saw that the Amorite king was disposed to enter upon hostilities with them, he thought he ought not to bear that insult, and determining to wean the Hebrews from their indolent temper, and prevent the disorders which arose thence, which had been the occasion of their former sedition, nor indeed were they now thoroughly easy in their minds, he inquired of God whether he would give them leave to fight. Which when he had done, and God also promised him the victory, he was himself very courageous, and ready to proceed to fighting. Accordingly he encouraged the soldiers, and he desired of them that they would take the pleasure of fighting, now God gave them leave so to do. They then, upon the receipt of this permission, which they so much longed for, put on their whole armor, and set about the work without delay. But the Amorite king was not now like to himself when the Hebrews were ready to attack him, but both he himself was affrighted at the Hebrews, and his army, which before had showed themselves to be of good courage, were then found to be timorous, so they could not sustain the first onset, nor bear up against the Hebrews, but fled away, as thinking this would afford them a more likely way for their escape than fighting, for they depended upon their cities, which were strong, from which yet they reaped no advantage when they were forced to fly to them, for as soon as the Hebrews saw them giving ground, they immediately pursued them close, and when they had broken their ranks, they greatly terrified them, and some of them broke off from the rest, and ran away to the cities. Now the Hebrews pursued them briskly, and obstinately persevered in the labors they had already undergone, and being very skillful in slinging, and very dexterous in throwing of darts, or anything else of that kind, and also having nothing but light armor, which made them quick in the pursuit, they overtook their enemies, and for those that were most remote, and could not be overtaken, they reached them by their slings and their bows, so that many were slain, and those that escaped the slaughter were sorely wounded, and those were more distressed with thirst than with any of those that fought against them, for it was the summer season, and when the greatest number of them were brought down to the river out of a desire to drink, as also when others fled away by troops, the Hebrews came round them and shot at them, so that, what with darts and what with arrows, they made a slaughter of them all. Sihon their king was also slain. So the Hebrews spoiled the dead bodies and took their prey. The land also which they took was full of abundance of fruits, and the army went all over it without fear, and fed their cattle upon it. And they took the enemy's prisoners, for they could no way put a stop to them, since all the fighting men were destroyed. Such was the destruction which overtook the Amorites, who were neither sagacious in counsel, nor courageous in action. Hereupon the Hebrews took possession of their land, which is a country situate between three rivers, and naturally resembled an island. 
the river Arnon being its southern, the river Jabbok determining its northern side, which running into Jordan loses its own name and takes the other, while Jordan itself runs along by it on its western coast. When matters were come to this state, Og, the king of Gilead and Golanitis, fell upon the Israelites. He brought an army with him, and in haste to the assistance of his friend Sihon. But though he found him already slain, yet did he resolve still to come and fight the Hebrews, supposing he should be too hard for them, and being desirous to try their valor. But failing of his hope, he was both himself slain in the battle, and all his army was destroyed. So Moses passed over the river Jabbok, and overran the kingdom of Og. He overthrew their cities, and slew all their inhabitants, who yet exceeded in riches all the men in that part of the continent, on account of the goodness of the soil, and the great quantity of their wealth. Now Og had very few equals, either in the largeness of his body, or handsomeness of his appearance. He was also a man of great activity in the use of his hands, so that his actions were not unequal to the vast largeness and handsome appearance of his body. And men could easily guess at his strength and magnitude when they took his bed at Rabbath, the royal city of the Ammonites. Its structure was of iron, its breadth four cubits, and its length a cubit more than double thereto. However, his fall did not only improve the circumstances of the Hebrews for the present, but by his death he was the occasion of further good success to them, for they presently took those sixty cities, which were encompassed with excellent walls, and had been subject to him, and all got both in general and in particular a great prey. Chapter 6. Concerning Balaam the prophet, and what kind of man he was. Now Moses, when he had brought his army to Jordan, pitched his camp in the great plain over against Jericho. This city is a very happy situation, and very fit for producing palm trees and balsam. And now the Israelites began to be very proud of themselves, and were very eager for fighting. Moses then, after he had offered for a few days sacrifices of thanksgiving to God, and feasted the people, sent a party of armed men to lay waste the country of the Midianites, and to take their cities. Now the occasion which he took for making war upon them was this that follows. When Balak, the king of the Moabites, who had from his ancestors a friendship and league with the Midianites, saw how great the Israelites were grown, he was much affrighted on account of his own and his kingdom's danger, for he was not acquainted with this, that the Hebrews would not meddle with any other country, but were to be contented with the possession of the land of Canaan, God having forbidden them to go any farther. So he, with more haste than wisdom, resolved to make an attempt upon them by words. But he did not judge it prudent to fight against them, after they had such prosperous successes, and even became out of ill successes more happy than before. But he thought to hinder them, if he could, from growing greater, and so he resolved to send ambassadors to the Midianites about them. Now these Midianites, knowing there was one Balaam, who lived by Euphrates, and was the greatest of the prophets at that time, and one that was in friendship with them, sent some of their honorable princes, along with the ambassadors of Balak, to entreat the prophet to come to them, that he might imprecate curses to the destruction of the Israelites. So Balaam received the ambassadors, and treated them very kindly. And when he had supped, he inquired what was God's will, and what this matter was for which the Midianites entreated him to come to them. But when God opposed his going, he came to the ambassadors, and told them that he was himself very willing and desirous to comply with their request, but informed them that God was opposite to his intentions, even that God who had raised him to great reputation on account of the truth of his predictions, for that this army, which they entreated him to come and curse, was in the favor of God, on which account he advised them to go home again, and not to persist in their enmity against the Israelites. And when he had given them that answer, he dismissed the ambassadors." Now the Midianites, at the earnest request and fervent entreaties of Balak, sent other ambassadors to Balaam, who, desiring to gratify the men, inquired again of God. But he was displeased at second trial, and bid him by no means to contradict the ambassadors. 
Now Balaam did not imagine that God gave this injunction in order to deceive him, so he went along with the ambassadors. But when the divine angel met him in the way, when he was in a narrow passage and hedged in with a wall on both sides, the ass on which Balaam rode understood that it was a divine spirit that met him, and thrust Balaam to one of the walls, without regard to the stripes which Balaam, when he was hurt by the wall, gave her. But when the ass, upon the angels continuing to distress her, and upon the stripes which were given her, fell down, by the will of God, she made use of the voice of a man, which complained of Balaam as acting unjustly to her, that whereas he had no fault to find with her in her former service to him, he now inflicted stripes upon her, as not understanding that she was hindered from serving him in what he was now going about, by the providence of God. And when he was disturbed by reason of the voice of the ass, which was that of a man, the angel plainly appeared to him, and blamed him for the stripes he had given his ass, and informed him that the brute creature was not in fault, but that he was himself come to obstruct his journey, as being contrary to the will of God upon which Balaam was afraid, and was preparing to turn back again. Yet did God excite him to go on his intended journey, but added this injunction, that he should declare nothing but what he himself should suggest to his mind. When God had given him this charge, he came to Balak, and when the king had entertained him in a magnificent manner, he desired him to go to one of the mountains to take a view of the state of the camp of the Hebrews. Balak himself also came to the mountain, and brought the prophet along with him, with a royal attendance. This mountain lay over their heads, and was distant sixty furlongs from the camp. Now when he saw them, he desired the king to build him seven altars, and to bring him as many bulls and rams, to which desire the king did presently conform. He then slew the sacrifices, and offered them as burnt offerings, that he might observe some signal of the flight of the Hebrews. Then said he, quote, Happy is this people, on whom God bestows the possession of innumerable good things, and grants them his own providence to be their assistant and their guide, so that there is not any nation among mankind, but you will be esteemed superior to them in virtue, and in the earnest prosecution of the best rules of life, and of such as are pure from wickedness, and will leave those rules to your excellent children, and this out of the regard that God bears to you, and the provision of such things for you as may render you happier than any other people under the sun. You shall retain that land to which he hath sent you, and it shall ever be under the command of your children, and both all the earth, as well as the seas, shall be filled with your glory. And you shall be sufficiently numerous to supply the world in general, and every region of it in particular, with inhabitants out of your stock. However, O blessed army, wonder that you are become so many from one father, and truly the land of Canaan can now hold you, as being yet comparatively few. But know ye that the whole world is proposed to be your place of habitation for ever. The multitude of your posterity also shall live as well in the islands as on the continent, and that more in number than are the stars of heaven. And when you are become so many, God will not relinquish the care of you, but will afford you an abundance of all good things in times of peace, with victory and dominion in times of war. May the children of your enemies have an inclination to fight against you, and may they be so hardy as to come to arms, and to assault you in battle, for they will not return with victory, nor will their return be agreeable to their children and wives. To so great a degree of valor will you be raised by the providence of God, who is able to diminish the affluence of some, and to supply the wants of others. Thus did Balaam speak by inspiration, as not being in his own power, but moved to say what he did by the divine spirit. But then Balak was displeased, and said that he had broken the contract he had made, whereby he was to come, as he and his confederates had invited him, by the promise of great presence. For whereas he came to curse their enemies, he had made an encomium upon them, and had declared that they were the happiest of men. To which Balaam replied, O Balak, if thou rightly considerest this whole matter, 
canst thou suppose that it is in our power to be silent or to say anything when the spirit of god seizes upon us for he puts such words as he pleases in our mouths and such discourses as we are not ourselves conscious of i well remember by what entreaties both you and the midianites so joyfully brought me hither and on that account i took this journey it was my prayer that i might not put any affront upon you as to what you desired of me but god is more powerful than the purposes i had made to serve you for those that take upon them to foretell the affairs of mankind as from their own abilities are entirely unable to do it or to forbear to utter what god suggests to them or to offer violence to his will for when he prevents us and enters into us nothing that we say is our own i then did not intend to praise this army nor to go over the several good things which god intended to do to their race but since he was so favorable to them and so ready to bestow upon them a happy life and eternal glory he suggested the declaration of those things to me but now because it is my desire to oblige thee myself as well as the midianites whose entreaties it is not decent for me to reject go to let us again rear other altars and offer the like sacrifices that we did before that i may see whether i can persuade god to permit me to bind these men with curses which when balak had agreed to god would not even upon second sacrifices consent to his cursing the israelites then fell balaam upon his face and foretold what calamities would befall the several kings of the nations and the most eminent cities some of which of old were not so much as inhabited which events have come to pass among the several people concerned both in the foregoing ages and in this till my own memory both by sea and by land from which completion of all these predictions that he made one may easily guess that the rest will have their completion in time to come but balak being very angry that the israelites were not cursed sent away balaam without thinking him worthy of any honor whereupon when he was just upon his journey in order to pass the euphrates he sent for balak and for the princes of the midianites and spake thus to them o balak and you midianites that are here present for i am obliged even without the will of god to gratify you it is true no entire destruction can seize upon the nation of the hebrews neither by war nor by plague nor by scarcity of the fruits of the earth nor can any other unexpected accident be their entire ruin for the providence of god is concerned to preserve them from such a misfortune nor will it permit any such calamity to come upon them whereby they may all perish but some small misfortunes and those for a short time whereby they may appear to be brought low may still befall them but after that they will flourish again to the terror of those that brought those mischiefs upon them so that if you have a mind to gain the victory over them for a short space of time you will obtain it by following my directions do you therefore set out the handsomest of such of your daughters as are most eminent for beauty and proper to force and conquer the modesty of those that behold them and these decked and trimmed to the highest degree able then do you send them to be near camp and give them in charge that the young men of the hebrews desire there allow it them and when they see they are enamoured of them let them take leaves and if they entreat them to stay let give their consent till they have persuaded leave of their obedience to their own laws the worship of that god who established them to worship the gods of the midianites and for by this means god will be angry at them accordingly when balaam had suggested counsel to them he went his way so when the midianites had sent their daughters as balaam had exhorted them the hebrew men were allured by their beauty and came with them and besought them not to grudge them the enjoyment of their beauty nor to deny them their conversation these daughters of midianites received their words gladly and consented to it and stayed with them but when they brought them to be enamoured of them and their inclinations to them were grown to ripeness they began to think of departing from them then it was that these men became greatly disconsolate at the women's departure and they were urgent with them not to leave them but begged they would continue there and become their wives and they promised them they should be owned as mistresses all they had 
This they said with an oath, and called God for the arbitrator of what they promised, and this with tears in their eyes, and all such marks of concern, as might show how miserable they thought themselves without them, and so might move their compassion for them. So the women, as soon as they perceived they had made their slaves, and had caught them with their conversation, began to speak thus to them. O oh, you illustrious young men, we have of our own at home, and great plenty of good things there, together with the natural affectionate parents and friends, nor is it out of our want of any such things that we come to discourse with you. Nor did we admit of your invitation with design to prostitute the beauty of our bodies for gain. But taking you for brave and worthy men, we agreed to your request, that we might treat you with such honors as hospitality required. And now seeing you say that you have a great affection for us, and are troubled when you think we are departing, we are not averse to your entreaties. And if we may receive such assurance of your good will, as we think can be alone sufficient, we will be glad to lead our lives with you as your wives. But we are afraid that you will in time be weary of our company, and will then abuse us, and send us back to our parents after an ignominious manner. And they desired that they would excuse them in their guarding against that danger. But the young men professed they would give them any assurance they should desire, nor did they at all contradict what they requested, so great was the passion they had for them. If then, said they, this be your resolution, since you make use of such customs and conduct of life as are entirely different from all other men, insomuch that your kinds of food are peculiar to yourselves, and your kinds of drink not common to others, it will be absolutely necessary, if you should have us for your wives, that you do with all worship our gods. Nor can there be any other demonstration of the kindness which you say you already have, and promise to have hereafter to us, than this, that you worship the same gods that we do. For has any one reason to complain that now you are come into this country, you should worship the proper gods of the same country? especially while our gods are common to all men, and yours such as belong to nobody else but yourselves. So they said they must either come into such methods of divine worship as all others came into, or else they must look out for another world, wherein they may live by themselves according to their own laws. Now the young men were induced by the fondness they had for these women to think they spake very well, so they gave themselves up to what they persuaded them, and transgressed their own laws, and supposing there were many gods, and resolving that they would sacrifice to them according to the laws of that country which ordained them, they both were delighted with their strange food, and went on to do everything that the women would have them do, though in contradiction to their own laws. So far indeed that this transgression was already gone through the whole army of the young men, and they fell into a sedition that was much worse than the former, and into danger of the entire abolition of their own institutions. For when once the youth had tasted of these strange customs, they went with insatiable inclinations into them, and even where some of the principal men were illustrious on account of the virtues of their fathers, they also were corrupted together with the rest. Even Zimri, the head of the tribe of Simeon, accompanied with Cosby, a Midianitish woman, who was the daughter of Sir, a man of authority in that country, and being desired by his wife to disregard the laws of Moses, and to follow those she was used to, he complied with her, and this both by sacrificing after a manner different from his own, and by taking a stranger to wife. When things were thus, Moses was afraid that matters should grow worse, and called the people to a congregation, but then accused nobody by name, as unwilling to drive those into despair who, by lying concealed, might come to repentance. But he said that they did not do what was either worthy of themselves or of their fathers, by preferring pleasure to God, and to the living according to his will. That it was fit they should change their courses while their affairs were still in a good state, and think that to be true fortitude which offers not violence to their laws, but that which resists their lusts and besides that, he said it was not a reasonable thing, when they had lived soberly in the wilderness, to act madly now that they were in prosperity, and that they ought not to lose, now that they have abundance, 
what they had gained when they had little. And so did he endeavor by saying this to correct the young inert, and to bring them to repentance for what they had done. But Zimri arose up after him and said, Yes, indeed, Moses, thou art at liberty to make use of such laws as thou art so fond of, and hast, by accustoming thyself to them, made them firm. Otherwise, if things had not been thus, thou hadst often been punished before now, and hadst known that the Hebrews are not easily put upon. But thou shalt not have me one of thy followers in thy tyrannical commands, for thou dost nothing else hitherto, but, under pretense of laws and of God, wickedly impose on us slavery, and gain dominion to thyself, while thou deprivest us of the sweetness of life, which consists in acting according to our own wills, and is the right of free men, and of those that have no lord over them. Nay, indeed, this man is harder upon the Hebrews than were the Egyptians themselves, as pretending to punish according to his laws, every one's acting what is most agreeable to himself but thou thyself better deservest to suffer punishment, who presumest to abolish what every one acknowledges to be what is good for him, and aimest to make thy single opinion to have more force than that of all the rest. And what I now do, and think to be right, I shall not hereafter deny to be according to my own sentiments. I have married, as thou sayest rightly, a strange woman, and thou hearest what I do from myself, as from one that is free, for truly I do not intend to conceal myself. I also own that I sacrificed to those gods to whom you do not think it fit to sacrifice. And I think it right to come at truth by inquiring of many people, and not like one that lives under tyranny, to suffer the whole hope of my life to depend upon one man. Nor shall any one find cause to rejoice who declares himself to have more authority over my actions than myself. Now when Zimri had said these things, about what he and some others had wickedly done, the people held their peace, both out of fear of what might come upon them, and because they saw that their legislator was not willing to bring his insolence before the public any further, or openly to contend with him. For he avoided that, lest many should imitate the impudence of his language, and thereby disturb the multitude. Upon this the assembly was dissolved. However, the mischievous attempt had proceeded further if Zimri had not been first slain, which came to pass on the following occasion. Phineas, a man in other respects better than the rest of the young men, and also one that surpassed his contemporaries in the dignity of his father, for he was the son of Eleazar the high priest, and the grandson of Aaron, Moses' brother, who was greatly troubled at what was done by Zimri, he resolved in earnest to inflict punishment on him, before his unworthy behavior should grow stronger by impunity, and in order to prevent this transgression from proceeding further, which would happen if the ringleaders were not punished. He was of so great magnanimity, both in strength of mind and body, that when he undertook any very dangerous attempt, he did not leave it off till he overcame it, and got an entire victory." So he came into Zimri's tent, and slew him with his javelin, and with it he slew Cosby also. Upon which all those young men that had a regard to virtue, and aimed to do a glorious action, imitated Phineas's boldness, and slew those that were found to be guilty of the same crime with Zimri. Accordingly, many of those that had transgressed perished by the magnanimous valor of those young men, and the rest all perished by a plague, which distemper God himself inflicted upon them, so that all those their kindred, who, instead of hindering them from such wicked actions as they ought to have done, had persuaded them to go on, were esteemed by God as partners in their wickedness, and died. Accordingly, there perished out of the army no fewer than fourteen, or twenty-four, thousand at this time. This was the cause why Moses was provoked to send an army to destroy the Midianites, concerning which expedition we shall speak presently, when we have first related what we have omitted. For it is but just not to pass over our legislator's due encomium on account of his conduct here, because, although this Balaam, who was sent for by the Midianites to curse the Hebrews, and when he was hindered from doing it by divine providence, did still suggest that advice to them, 
by making use of which our enemies had well nigh corrupted the whole multitude of the Hebrews with their wiles, till some of them were deeply infected with their opinions. Yet did he do him great honor by setting down his prophecies in writing. And while it was in his power to claim this glory for himself, and make men believe they were his own predictions, there being no one that could be a witness against him, and accuse him for so doing, he still gave his attestation to him, and did him the honor to make mention of him on this account. But let every one think of these matters as he pleases. End of Book 4, Chapters 5 and 6